Welcome to the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium. I'm your guest host, Stephanie Routh, uh, Executive Director of Oregon Walks. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Um, with me is um, our two fabulous folks who are going to be talking about flashing yellow arrows. Uh, to my left is Stacy Shetler, is the Traffic Engineering Manager at Washington County. He has 15 years of experience managing staff of 20 and is responsible for signals, signing, and striping. He um, and Washington County were co-sponsors of the Flashing Yellow Arrow Research Project uh, in the county that we're going to be talking about today. And to my right, to your left, is David Horwitz. He's an assistant professor of C civil engineering at the Oregon State University. Uh, his research focus is on traffic operations and safety. Among his other top research hits include driving simulated studies of the dilemma zone. So Stacy and David, thank you very much for being here today. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, uh, traffic, uh, we, what we'll be talking about, traffic is like a set of dance steps that people commit to when using the streets that are also the dance hall uh, of our lives. I think most of us in our lives can remember a new set of dance steps erupting onto the dance scene, the moonwalk, uh, uh, the running man. Um, and so two new da dance steps uh, are on the traffic scene. We've had recently green bike boxes, cycle tracks, um, and barns dances, uh, if you have ever seen those. <laughs> A relatively new traffic dance step has come to the Portland region in the form of flashing yellow arrows in Washington County. So today we want to talk about uh, why Washington County incorporated flashing yellow arrows, what the response has been, uh, why, uh, what have Washington County and research partners learned, and where do we go from here? So uh, people in the world of the webinar, we hear there are many of you, and we're very excited that you're here. Um, we hope that you'll be asking your burning questions via the Ustream or on using the email address that we hear is floating somewhere on your screens. So uh, we'll be getting to those questions towards the end of our program, but worry not, we will have recorded them. So I wanted to start with Stacy. Um, what was the context for the research? Well, permissive left turns at traffic signals, it's not a new idea. They've been around for several years. However, the flashing yellow arrow is a pretty new indication for the, the Portland area. In Washington County, uh, we've, we've been installing them probably you know, hundred lo hundreds of locations throughout the county. Uh, they've been growing in popularity, and throughout the nation, they've been adopted. So the flashing yellow arrow, it's a new, relatively new way to show the permissive left turn and uh, the early research had been mainly focused on you know, the driver-driver interaction and not so much the driver-pedestrian behavior. And so the work that this has done with uh, David Hurwitz's research looked at more of the driver-pedestrian interaction. He was able to set up more complex design and then also the measurement equipment was a lot more advanced. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to do flashing yellow arrows in Washington County? Like, was there someone specific who was calling for it? Well, we started out in about 2006, and we had installed uh, four for Nike. Nike had seen how effective they were in Beaverton. They ran a, a shuttle around to the MAC station, their other campuses. And they saw the benefits to be able to turn left on, uh, turn left to intersections when there were, there were gaps. And so we put those in there. They were pretty successful. We had real positive experience. And so then as uh, funding came along, we started to develop a program where we could expand that. And then with the federal uh, stimulus money, we were able to do a massive deployment of them. Mm -hmm. So you know, from 2006 to now, what did you see in terms of behavior before um, they were implemented? And what are you seeing on the streets now? Well, the most of our implementations were going from protected only to protected permissive. And so that's, that's much different than than using the flashing yellow arrow to replace the older style permissive left. And so that, um, that definitely opens up more pedestrian conflicts, more vehicle conflicts. But on the, so on the positive side of things, we saw an immediate and overwhelming um, positive response from the driving community. You know, people waiting to turn left when it's clearly safe to go, it's, it's a waste of time and frustrating. You know, we saw um, reductions in congestion and delay and, um, you know, the biggest complaint at the time was, you know, why didn't my street get one? Why not the signal on my commute? On the negative side, changing from the protected only to, to the protected permissive introduced those conflicts with pedestrians. And so pedestrians started to call. 
and they would call about um, you know, certain locations, and they would describe what I would consider poor driver behavior. And you know, they were conflicted because they really liked the flashing yellow arrow as a driver, but then when they were a pedestrian, then they felt nervous about it. Mm -hmm. So like when they're a driver, like this is the most awesome thing ever. And then when they're getting out of their car, you know, trying to walk across the streets, like why would anyone do this? Yeah, exactly. That's great. <laughs> so what did the county do about, you know, those complaints? How did you respond to that? Well, even before our massive rollout, we did a public outreach effort that, um, that consisted of some media releases, but also a YouTube video that uh, we really tried to stress um, vehicles to watch out for bikes and pedestrians as they start using the, the, the flashing yellow arrow. We also had some technology ideas, but our, the model of our controllers were, were older and we didn't have many options with that. Um, however, the newer controllers had more flexibility and more horsepower, more brain power. And so we wrote a scope of work with Kittle, Kilson and Associates, a local engineering and plan, planning firm, to try and take some of our ideas and develop into controller logic. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we did was participate in this research. We co-sponsored it, and we also worked with David and his team to try and identify locations in Washington County where we had more troubles and see if they could model some of that in their, sim in their simulation. Well, that was a great segue, so thank you very much. So David, um, what, did, uh, what did you set about to do with the research? Well, in partnership with Chris Monsier's research team at Portland State University, we wanted to get a, a better understanding of how uh, the visual search task of drivers, uh, where and when they're looking, um, how that related to the presence and direction of pedestrians in the crosswalk, as well as the volumes of conflicting through moving vehicles. And we also wanted to consider the implications of a three versus four section signal head for the presentation of the flashing yellow. Was this research that you were thinking of needed to happen before Washington County came, or were you like, that was a great idea, why haven't I thought about that? The, the, the motivation was absolutely questions and interest from Washington County, um, but this is a topic that's been one of interest to me for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I was a graduate student on some of the early uh, simulator studies that considered whether drivers appropriately comprehended the flashing yellow arrow that took place at uh, one of the studies at UMass Amherst. So how do you test behavior? Well, th th there's lots of different alternatives. Um, when we try and study any transportation system user's behavior, um, one powerful tool is a, a thing called a driving simulator, um, which allows us to model a virtual environment and expose, uh, in our lab, drivers and cyclists to virtually constructed intersections and roadway segments so we can understand how they interact in risky scenarios. Mm -hmm. So with a simulator, you know, people know that they're being watched, you know, and there's that age-old adage to observe is to change. So what does a simulator environment tell you and what does it not tell you about what you can see in the road environment? It, that's a really important question. Um, when we think about uh, translating the results from a driving simulator laboratory into the real world, there are a number of questions that we have to ask. Um, the first and most critical is that we're, we're asking a research question in the lab that has some meaning in the real world. And we, we assess that potential through a validation process. And we can, we can validate the results in a driving simulator either absolutely where it generates a one-to-one -one mapping with the real world um, or relatively where we can uh, generate uh, observations of direction and magnitude but not perhaps accurate and specific information that would be a one-to-one -one mapping in the real world. Okay. So could you map out for us you know, what that research looked like, what that simulator looked like? Yeah, sure. So the, the driving simulator lab at Oregon State University is what we would call a high-fidelity um, motion-based driving simulator. That means it's a, a, a real uh, 2009 Ford Fusion sedan sitting on a motion base platform. It's surrounded by 14 by 14 foot tall screens that we project a computer animated built environment around. Um, our lab's pretty unique. It allows us to render the environment directly behind the driver. We have LCD screens in the side view mirrors and we also have a digital instrument panel. So that's the platform with which we use to conduct this type of research. Okay, and so then what, what did people see? Uh, specifically, we tried to replicate some of the most important features from a half dozen or so intersections that Washington County had identified uh, more, the, some of their most significant public complaints around. And we looked at things like the cross-sectional width of the roadways, the lane configurations, mm -hmm. the positioning of uh, vehicular signal heads as well as pedestrian signal heads, locations of crosswalks, all the, the traffic control elements 
and general geometric layout of those intersections. Mm -hmm. And each subject uh, interacted with 24 different scenarios. And so one, um, let's see, what am I trying to say? Uh, you didn't find any difference um, in terms of where drivers looked between um, the signals with three lenses on them, the three section signal heads, and, and the ones with four. And that seemed to be kind of a highlighted finding. So why is that important? Sure, so let's think about the data set just for a moment. Yeah. So there's lots of information that we can capture from a driving simulator study. We can record the centroid of the vehicle, time and space headways between subsequent cars. For this particular study, we were interested in glance patterns. So we used a device called an eye tracker, and we measured exactly where and when our driving subjects looked at the traffic control elements at each signalized intersection. And in particular, we, we selected a measure called the average fixation duration. Um, it's worth mentioning that a fixation, there's two characteristics about the visual search task that are interesting. Um, when we look around, there are fixations and saccades. And a fixation is glancing at a particular object at one location for a tenth of a second or longer. And that's the measurement that we focused on here. When we talk about interacting with transportation systems, it's the one we care about most because that's where we acquire most of our information. So if we're trying to interpret, interpret the meaning of a traffic signal or the position of a vulnerable road user like a pedestrian, this is the measure that we care about in particular. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the, the three signals, what were some of the other things that you were looking at? So for that measure, we didn't find any difference between the four-section presentation or the three-section presentation when just considering the visual search task. Drivers didn't spend longer looking at one indication versus the other. Their, their glance patterns didn't change between those two. Okay. Um, and a lot of drivers, another finding, a lot of drivers didn't actually look at pedestrians before they entered into the, the intersection. Is that correct? Sure. So based on the scenarios that we considered, which involved uh, the volume and direction of pedestrians, the volume of conflicting throughs, and these two different presentations of the flashing yellow, um, anywhere from 4 to 7% of the time, our left-turning drivers didn't fixate on the pedestrians in the crosswalk. So they didn't see them? Sure, That's absolutely. That's alarming. <laughs> so how does that translate into risk for pedestrians? Well, whenever we talk about uh, safety, one of the considerations is uh, do our system users detect potential hazards? And if there's a measurable portion of the time where they don't see a cyclist or a pedestrian, that becomes a concern for us. You, mm -hmm. you can't avoid a collision if you don't detect that hazard in your visual field. Mm -hmm. So was, was there a difference in like where people were at the 4% or where people were in the 7%? Sure. Right. So uh, in particular, we found that uh, folks spent less time searching, looking at the pedestrians when there were fewer pedestrians in the crosswalk. So in particular, when one pedestrian was walking away from the car or one pedestrian was walking towards the car, and 4% uh, was uh, the pedestrian walking away from the car, and 7% was the pedestrian walking towards the car, based okay. on the, the limited number of scenarios that we studied here. Okay, and so was there, any, was there any look at, we were talking earlier about what you can and cannot see in the simulator. So did you, uh, did you then look to observe in, in the roadway itself? You know, were you seeing the same thing in the simulator as people were seeing in the... Um, in the road? Uh, so, so we mentioned the data set that we spent most of our time analyzing was this visual search task of our drivers. Um, we did do some validation work, and, and that's a portion of the study that Chris Monsier led and did a fantastic job collecting video um, at some of the field locations where the flashing yellow arrow was present. The mapped data set we used there was the position of the vehicle um, in relation to where they, they stopped and where the stop line was and where they started their permissive left turn. We also studied the position of the pedestrian in the crosswalk and uh, where that ped was when the driver made their left turn. And, and those results were similar. So we saw at least relative validity in, in some of those measures. So, and so of other influences, you were saying that the number of pedestrians or cyclists in an area changed um, some of that behavior? Yeah, That's sure. So as the, as the volume of conflicting vehicles increased, we found more time was spent by the driver searching for that effective gap. 
and we saw a similar pattern with the number of pedestrians. More pedestrians present in the crosswalk, we saw more time fixating on those pedestrians, trying to detect their specific positions. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm hearing from this, and because I'm a lay person, I was actually an opera theater double major, so <laughs> I just want to make sure that, that I'm understanding you, so that uh, if you have, for example, a, a heavy vehicle traffic, you have a lot of lanes, um, and a, a lot happening, say like 185th in Washington County, you're going to see people who are looking almost exclusively, is that correct, at, um, at drivers and and fixating on those to make sure that they can make a gap. But if there are, um, if there's kind of a more of a, a pedestrian to driver ratio, they're going to be more likely to um, to fixate on those vulnerable road users. The the from the limited number of scenarios that we observed, um, the, the driver spent most of their time searching for a gap in the conflicting vehicular traffic. And what you would see in the glance patterns was a bouncing back and forth between the conflicting vehicles and the indication to make sure that they still had um, that permitted left turn. And in general, what we saw for the cases that we consider was um, the more vehicles there were, the more time they spent trying to find that gap. And the fewer pedestrians there were, the less likely that the driver was to search out those pedestrians in the crosswalk mm -hmm. while simultaneously searching for that gap in traffic. And did this match um, your hypothesis going in? Did, or were these findings surprising in any way? Uh, a, uh, a priori, I was, I was surprised that we found um, as many occurrences where the driver didn't fixate on the pedestrians. I, I would not have expected that a priori. Huh. Okay. Um, and I feel like <laughs> we've been neglecting you, Stacey. Oh. <laughs> and we'll get to you in just a second. Um, uh, but did you have a number that you were looking to see? Was four to seven also in your uh, theory? It, 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 to me, any time where there are vulnerable road users, in particular at signalized intersections, that are not being detected by drivers, that, that's concerning to me. Okay. So does this mean we shouldn't allow permissive lefts? Uh, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, but it's some preliminary evidence, I think, to suggest that we need to more carefully consider the implications of active transportation when we're thinking about how to use permitted left turns. Okay. And I guess this is to both of you, like, what are those considerations and how does this impact uh, the, the implementation for Washington County going forward? I think it's, well, it's definitely, uh, you know, the, the level of traffic and the, the pedestrian levels need to be taken into, into consideration. Um, I think that uh, you can put a driver in a position to make a, a better choice based on, you know, what they're saying and what the pedestrians are doing. Um, so as a practitioner, I think we need to use the, the tools that are available to try and to help the driving task be a little bit more simpler, especially in a situation where they are focused on oncoming traffic or it's busy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I had asked David before what, you know, if these were, if these findings were what he expected. Were these findings what you expected? Well, I think generally speaking, it's what we expected. Um, you know, we talk about the four to seven you know, percent of people that didn't look. I don't think that's really translating into crashes from our experience. I think we've had five pedestrian vehicle crashes over the last three years and we've got you know about 375 approaches that have the flashing yellow arrow. So you know I don't think the crash the the risks are translating to crashes but I think it's definitely um, you know affected pedestrians comfort level out there. And that seems to, to go with what some of the complaints you know that there's there's the boolean you know, result of, of crash, not crash, you know, that's pretty hard and fast. But the, yeah. that idea of perceived safety and, and confidence and comfort with different road users. So um, how are you looking to, to implement uh, Chris and David's research? Well, we were hoping um, at the beginning of the research that it would, you know, would tell us what the, the key factors are for driver and pedestrian safety. You know, it did, it did look at that, but it didn't quite get down to the specifics that, that we were looking at, especially with uh, the driver position. You know, are they staying behind the stop bar? Are they moving into the intersection? Um, you know, it's, we wanted to develop policies and best practices around the use of the flashing yellow arrow. And although I think the research is a great start, I think there's, there's more underneath the surface that they, that they can dig out that'll help us to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. And Pacific Northwest, I mean, are they, we were talking actually a little bit before this webinar started, like the difference 
of people, you know, scooting out a little bit and people jumping. So what do you see, what did you see on the streets in terms of permissive lefts? Well, on the streets we see a variety of behavior. Um, you know, there's debates within circles, within Oregon, you know, what the law really says. And a few years ago, the legislature tried to clear it up in the ORS 11, uh, 811 260 that said you could enter an intersection on flashing yellow arrow. But they really didn't clean up the language with the you know, ORS 811 290, which says that you can't block an intersection. And so, you know, whether it's legal or not legal, we still recommend people stay behind the stop bar. That way they've got their whole field of vision in front of them. You know, they're able to see that, that late entering ped or that ped that's overtaking them on the left. Um, they haven't committed to be, you know, to taking a gap. So if there aren't available gaps, then they could just wait for the next time. By moving into the intersection, they've moved off the, the sensor in the pavement that is telling the signal that there's demand. So Washington. they could be out there forever. Well, that, but what's probably going to happen is they're going to go through on, a, on the yellow clearance interval. They'll, they'll use that, that space. Um, if they're sitting in the intersection, you know, they may be keying in on what's happening with the adjacent, their adjacent lanes. So they may not focus on uh, their flashing yellow arrow. They may see out of their peripheral the adjacent through lanes go yellow and may think that, that their lane is cycling. And so they try to, to go and then get in a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle crash. Mm -hmm. So we've always tried to encourage uh, people to stay behind the stop bar. In other states and other places, you know, uh, exactly the opposite. You know, some people say you should move into the intersection. It shortens the distance for the left turn. You know, there's, there's a pros and cons, I think, to, to each approach. Uh, I'm just imagining, you know, we have so many people coming from, from different states to live in Washington County, and there is such a, uh, a population growth. If you could, like, look at someone's behavior in an intersection, it's like, yeah, that guy's from New England. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh, they're from Seattle. That's so sweet. <laughs> they're staying behind the stop bar. So, so what does that mean? You were talking before about um, permissive and protective permissive. Um, and so how, how can a pedestrian, are there cases, you know, where, uh, where a pedestrian can, you know, is there a ped actuation? What are you looking at in terms of implementation for, uh, for pedestrians to, to move with confidence through the intersection? Well, to move with confidence... So with, um, with our older controller technology, we had basically one trick up our sleeve, and that was to delay the onset of the flashing yellow arrow, give the pedestrian time to get out in the intersection, establish the presence, create some movement to hopefully attract the attention of, of drivers. Um, that's what we had. Now with the, the newer control technology, the newer software, there's many more options. You can turn the flashing yellow arrow off by time of day oh, wow. based on the, how heavy the traffic is. And then with the logic that Kittleson developed for us, um, a pedestrian can push the pedestrian button, and then um, it'll suppress the flashing yellow arrow during the flash and the flashing don't walk. And so the pedestrian then has a protected movement uh, free of a, a left turning uh, vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that's if they're the, there at the beginning of the signal. And that's there at the beginning of the, the signal. We don't reservice the pedestrian. Um, that's a trade off mm -hmm. between mobility and safety. Um, we think it's a, we think it's a good trade-off, because what I see is the most risky situation is a is a late entering ped, uh, with a vehicle that's camped out in the middle of the intersection, slowly focused on finding those gaps, and then trying to shoot one of those gaps and have somebody coming up on their left. And, mm -hmm. and uh, with our with the roads in Washington County, you know, mainly suburban arterials, higher speeds, you know, the consequences of of hitting a pedestrian at, at a good rate of speed is, you know, I think. Are, it's pretty severe. Mm -hmm. It can be pretty severe. No, that's right. Um, it, how long would a pedestrian say, you know, they're, I come in, you know, 10 seconds into a signal, I push the button, you know, I'm going to have to wait an entire cycle. About how long would I have to wait? Well, uh, we tend to run our, in the PM peak, our cycle's 120 seconds, so two minutes. So if you missed it, uh, you'd be waiting until, you wouldn't be waiting a full two minutes. You'd be waiting, you know, minute, minute and a half. Okay. So I wouldn't feel like I was evolving 
you know, as a member of the species before I could get across the street. You, you may feel that way. Because um, <laughs> I'll admit there are a few where I do. Yeah. I, <laughs> I would never advocate a pedestrian to, to you know, to walk across a, a don't walk, but um, we've seen that behavior, some jaywalking. But at least if the pedestrian is making that decision, it's a conscious decision, they're looking, they're... Uh, they're taking account of their own safety and the situation around them, and if they feel it's safe to go, then you know sometimes we see them just go. Mm -hmm. So, what is the cost to implement um, these newfangled things from Kittleson and others? Well, with Kittleson, um, the DOT, the Oregon DOT, paid to have that logic or similar logic incorporated into the standard um, 2070 software, and that. Uh, and those are new ones going. Yes, the, the new ones. The, the technology has been around, you know, for a handful of years. But a lot of agencies like ourselves are just um, at the beginning stages of implementing them. Are you also retrofitting? Yeah, it's a it's a retrofit. So we're mm -hmm. taking the older style controller out and then putting the new newer style controller in. And with um, the DOT incorporating that logic into the software. Uh, every jurisdiction within Oregon has access through a statewide license that the D DOT has with uh, Northwest Signal and Supply for the Voyage software. You know, protecting the pedestrian movement with a flashing yellow arrow is a standard feature. It's free. Um, you just need a controller upgrade, which runs you know, fifteen to two thousand, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. Um, time to program it and time to put it out in the field. So, I think that it's. The costs are reasonable, especially if you target the locations where you're having problems with the with the technology. Mm -hmm. So, have you targeted specific locations? Yeah, we've we've definitely been um, selective about where we put the technology. We've started off with our higher speed arterials, um, such as such as 185th, Schultz Ferry Road, Murray Boulevard, Cornell Road. Mm -hmm. My parents live off 185th, so I just have to say thank you. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, also near schools or places where we, um, we thought there'd be children present. Um, and so how are you educating kids about flashing yellow arrows, or are you? In what respect? Um, I'm just wondering, like you were talking earlier about outreach, you know, related to uh, both pedestrian and biking behavior. You know, if they're near schools, is this something that, you know, given enough time, that um, that children or really any road user, you know, gets to a threshold where you know this becomes a more intuitive part of the traffic environment, or there's specific outreach that's needed to occur. Well, I think the, the the education is more so on the driver because they're the one needing to make the decision to yield to the pedestrians and oncoming traffic, and so I think you know the. The outreach needs to be focused on the driver. I think as pedestrians, we can also educate them to, you know, be aware of the surroundings. As far as you know, is the is the driver focusing on me? Has the driver moved out into the intersection? You know, is there a, is there a gap that you know the driver looks like they may take? And you know, that that thinking is a little more sophisticated for like a grade schooler or mm -hmm. a younger kid. So that's why you know we felt the logic that we employ is. Is so powerful that you know when the, the, when there's no pedestrians, the flashing yellow arrow just comes up like normal. When there are pedestrians, and it suppresses it for the mm -hmm. the whole walking cycle. So, well, um, I want to ask both of you, but I'm going to start with David because my neck's starting to creak. Uh, um, how do you feel that other people can use your research outside of Washington County? Well, to, to me, uh, the notion that we want to continue to educate the public, much as Washington County has, that uh, drivers, they can't merely focus on vehicular gaps in traffic. They also have to consider active transportation, like pedestrians, where we studied in this case, as well as cyclists, um, as well as uh, continuing to reinforce the message uh, uh, for uh, pedestrians in crosswalks not to have a false sense of security. So be very aware that there are certain instances where drivers don't see you or aren't searching for you actively. And I think raising the level of awareness of those two populations is a, a valuable endeavor. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. And Stacy, anything to add to that? No. Okay. It's like, well done, David. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a few more questions. And then I think we have um, a bundle of questions that have come uh, from our uh, from our dear um, watchers out there, um, 
and I think actually, oh, so I'm just curious why, you know, there are other jurisdictions in the region. Washington County has obviously been an, uh, an early adopter, uh, but uh, do you see, I mean, the city of Portland only uses them in a handful uh, of others. Do you see um, other jurisdictions looking to adopt this that you know of in the areas? Yeah, there's uh, there's several agencies that you know adopted even before Washington County did. See, the city of Beaverton, Clackamas County. Uh, you know, I think as the the tools get better, uh, these agencies feel more comfortable putting in flashing yellow arrows because they know they can ratchet back, and they can find the balance between safety and mobility that works for for their community. Mm -hmm. uh, city of Portland. It doesn't surprise me that they don't have a lot of flashing yellow arrows. You know, most of their signals are in a downtown grid. They don't have pedestrian push buttons, which is one of the things you would need to activate the logic. They have short cycle lengths, fixed timing, and no left turn lane. So there really isn't a benefit um, to run the flashing yellow arrow for the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. And did you, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to add, I can speak to a little bit. The city of Corvallis, where OSU is, um, is gradually adopting flashing yellows. Uh, our first eight phase traffic signal has four flashing yellows attached to it right next to our football stadium, which went online uh, just about six weeks ago now. Were you standing, I mean, was that a big deal for you? Like, were you at a, was there a grand opening? It was, uh, it, coincidentally, it happened to be on the first day of class. I was starting a graduate course on isolated signalized intersections, and our city traffic engineer happened to be at the intersection when I drove through <laughs> in the morning. So I stopped and had a nice long chat about all so, some of the design decisions that they made. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that he's quite comfortable with, and, and we're slowly adopting it, uh, choice locations in the city. That's great. For a second, I thought you were going to say that they just happened to, you know, implement it on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I sat out there with a piece of cake. So um, uh, I'm going to go to, uh, we have a number of questions that, uh, um, that I'm just going to read off. So um, do we know if people eventually get used to the flashing yellow arrows um, and just know to look for pedestrians? I think historically with many, uh, many innovative traffic control devices, um, there's initially levels of discomfort. And as uh, traffic engineers and the public increase the frequency with which they interact with these devices, um, they get more and more comfortable. I think a roundabout is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. There's typically, when we talk about proposing them, there's a little bit of pushback. And as drivers start to interact with them, they, they become quite comfortable. I'll let you sip. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's been our experience, too. Um, you know, uh, as we first started implementing them, people were you know, a little bit confused. You know, some people call it, you know, are these things, are the signals broken, they're flashing. <laughs> but, uh, you get people calling in, it's like, yeah, but over time, it's broken. But over time, they do, they do figure it out. Um, you know, they you know, drive by a pedestrian one or two times without seeing them. I think it really resonates, and then they, you know, they learn from that. Um, so over time, you know, I think we have seen uh, drivers adapt mm -hmm. to it. And I, I think that's one of the things we hope the research, or the research had the ability to show was, as those drivers went to the simulator, you know, were they not seeing pedestrians less often? You know, were they were they adapting even through the simulation mm -hmm. over time to see pedestrians? And so I think that's another nugget that we can mine out of that that um, study data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that was a question like, what does overtime mean? Like, if we're talking a week, if we're talking, you know, two years, it's like, ah, uh, you know, give it a couple of years, it'll all work out at the end. Um, another question, did you look at driver glance patterns for the uh, flashing yellow arrow versus you know, green ball, flashing red, other indicators? I, I think that's a great question. Um, we acted under the assumption that there's been some pretty substantive and good work um, that suggests that the flashing yellow is the best, if not one of the best, um, uh, ways to message to the driver that they have a permissive left. So we acted under the assumption that that question had relatively been, been resolved. Mm -hmm. um, so we, 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 did, we didn't consider that. Um, we, we were more interested in, geez, that we thought there was a gap in the data that had been collected between the three versus the four section presentation. And we wanted to contribute some data to support some of that decision making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, one of the important things to, to bring back is that the flashing yellow arrow is just a tool and the replacement of the previous protected permissive or the yeah, protected permissive signal, it's, it's much better. It's proven to be safer. I think where you know, the media and the attention has come out is where we've decided to take protected only and convert them to protected permissive. And so you know, there's a lot of uh, negative media attention surrounding the flashing yellow arrow, but it's probably more, should be more 
fairly directed towards going from protected only to protected permissive mm -hmm. and not the indication that's being used. Okay. Um, you were saying earlier, you know, that, that to upgrade or to, to implement is, is not expensive, but what does not expensive mean? Well, not expensive is just the multiplication about how many signals you actually have, so. Um, how much is one? Well, one, one signal, the controller, the computer itself is about $1,500, just uh, market price. And then depending on your software, uh, you know, in Oregon, it's, a, it's free. And then it would be either your staff time to load the controller and implement it out in the field or hire a consultant, which could be more, more expensive. How much time does it take? Well, it's, uh, it's pretty quick now because of their standard features. They're just check boxes within the software. So, you know, once you've migrated your signal timing from the old uh, mm -hmm. platform into the new platform, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it doesn't take but a, an hour or two. Oh, wow. It's like a quick, quick, quick. Yeah. Punto. So, you know, that's Oregon outside the, the region. You know, it's not just Oregon that's been thinking about this problem. You know, other vendors and manufacturers have been, have been working to come up with similar solutions. And so, you know, for someone that's not in Oregon, I would just check with their current supplier and see what's available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go to another question. Um, um, so your research, uh, David, found a difference in terms of driver attention between pedestrians walking toward the driver and away. Did this observation lead to any conclusions for you as a researcher? And, um, and then for Stacy, uh, did this give you any insights on how you might configure the signals? There's a lot to that. <laughs> one. Yeah. And so for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, sure. So from, from a from a research standpoint, I'm, I'm pretty interested in this lack of fixations, and I think um, knowing that there's a, there's some interesting data to be had there, I'd like to consider uh, a larger spectrum of volumes and directions so that we could build some models that would describe how the driver is, driver is interacting. I think the preliminary evidence suggests that there perhaps is something to some of the pedestrian comments. Um, but, but this is preliminary in nature, and it's, it's hard to draw real direct conclusions or, um, I, I think, design guidance decisions from some of the work that we did. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's interesting because um, there may be a correlation with the, the vehicular position, you know, whether they're behind the stop bar, whether they're in the intersection. Um, the other thing that could be considered would be an additional signal head that would be in a location you know, kind of across from the, the crosswalk that would give drivers another point to fixate on that would be closer to where the pedestrians are actually moving and then the oncoming traffic. Instead of, you know, looking up, they could just look to the side and that, and, you know, that might be a design consideration that would come mm -hmm. out of the, this research. Has there been any research on, on where to put something like that? There, there definitely has. That's a little bit outside yeah. sort of the scope of what we had done sure. here. Um, but we're always thinking about how we should always be thinking about how system users interact with the control devices and where we place them strategically. Um, but yeah, th there has been some work on that, but that's not something I've dug into as much for this particular question. That's a really neat idea that Stacy just brought up, though. Yeah. So, uh, and actually, just for both of you, what? Because oftentimes when you study something, you 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 know really dig into it. Um, you answer one question. And then you start to ask yourself, you know, five others. So what, what are some other questions that came up? Like if you were to be able to wave a funding magic wand, what would you want to, to research next? Um, I, I think the, a, a larger spectrum of scenarios in the lab would be useful um, to build more robust models about the, the direct statistical relationships between volumes uh, and gaps of both vehicles and pedestrians. What I might think that look like? Uh, more scenarios with a larger mm -hmm. sample size, most likely. Um, so, we, so we had three variables at a couple of different levels. I would want to expand the number of levels that we were able to study some of those variables at, mm -hmm. um, which is just time and, and revenue based. I'd also like to bring some of these observational strategies, in particular the devices that Chris used to collect data and process that video digitally in the field. Um, I, I think field study would be pretty critical if we wanted to make uh, more definitive recommendations about volumes and gaps to help guide um, 
really good decision making about where permissive left would yield the greatest uh, mobility benefits with the least safety detriments. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big gap there would be really useful to traffic engineers like Stacy. Mm -hmm. And are there other questions that, that this research brought up for you that you'd love to have answered? Well, I think uh, I think David covered covered what our interest was, and it was to develop better, you know, good policy and good practice, and having more definitive um, thresholds for when something's appropriate to use or not to use. I think that's where the benefit would be for for us. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've gained a lot of experience and knowledge just from our observations, but to actually come up with a policies, it's uh, you know better to have you know, research done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, one question that comes in, um, is there still a flashing yellow arrow when pedestrians have the walk? Can you clarify that? Yeah, so we, we've uh, implemented the, the logic that suppresses the flashing yellow arrow um, in the presence of the walk and flashing don't walk at about 40 of our 40 percent of our intersections, so about 75 percent, or excuse me, 75 of the 175 intersections where we have flashing yellow arrow have the logic to, to do that. So the other 60 percent don't have that. So it's they run normal. If we had issues when we used a leading pedestrian interval, you know, provided some extra time. Um, we tried to start with a higher speed arterials, more lanes, the more complex situations which would lend to what David's research showed that under a more, more lanes or more or heavier traffic, the driver's focusing less on the pedestrian. So that's where we started with that logic. And then as then we were moving towards the, the intersections that we feel aren't as, uh, you know, aren't as dangerous or don't pose the same risks that, um, that our heavier intersections do. So yeah, we are still running uh, traditional flashing yellow arrows with you know, none of the bells and whistles out there. Well, um, thanks, first of all, thanks to everyone who, um, who asked the questions. Those were great. And I just want to give a couple of um, our last remaining minutes, um, and because I uh, started um, with Stacy, or I started with David before, I want to start with Stacy. Um, if you have any last takeaways, closing thoughts. I think uh, my closing thoughts are, you know, I think the flashing LRR has gotten some bad media out of this research. But I think the, what the research does do is elevate the discussion, and the discussion being that drivers and pedestrians they need to be aware of each other as transportation users. You know, the flashing yellow arrow, it's better than the previous left turn display. Um, and then the, the good news is, is there's tools out there now with the controllers and the controller logic and the flashing yellow arrow display itself that'll help a practitioner or an agency or a community find the right balance between mobility and safety that works works for them. So I think that's the, the good news out there, is that uh, if you have a situation where you're having problems, there's something you can do about it. Cool. David? Jeez, uh, it's hard to follow that. I think <laughs> Stacy, Stacy put a really nice button on it. Um, uh, just to reemphasize the notion that, uh, you know, our pursuit of multimodal intersections requires the consideration of, of active transportation and uh, the notion that um, as traffic engineers we want to look at all the streams of traffic at a particular location to find that perfect balance between safety and mobility. Um, and just to extend uh, my thank you to Washington County for helping support the work that we did. Um, the guidance from Stacy and his team was outstanding and uh, you know the benefits of working with researchers like Chris Monsier's group at, here at PSU um, were, were just fantastic. So to give a, a nod to both of those organizations. Great. Thank you. Well, and I'd like to extend uh, our thanks to Stacey Shetler of Washington County, uh, to Ava David Hurwitz of uh, the Oregon State University, um, and also to our hosts, the Oregon Transportation Research and Education Consortium. And finally, uh, to Chris Monsier, who is in the room from Portland State University and didn't heckle us once. So thank you all very much, and we'll look forward to the next webinar.